thank you for watching. Um, today I want to talk about uh, an essay, I guess. I just read, um, that was related to my previous video. I was, um, I was reading that book about all of the heroes of liberty through the, through the ages, and I was particularly struck with the account about um, Henry David Thoreau and regretted never having read Civil Disobedience. So I went back and read it. Um, I'm glad I did. It was it was really good. It, it, it made me happy. Um, it's interesting. A lot of it is not necessarily new to me, but, um, but I was surprised that I was surprised about it coming from that time period because um, Thoreau wrote Civil Disobedience in 1849, which was one year prior to Bastiat writing the law. And um, I was really surprised that it was that long ago. I thought it, it was more of a modern, um, a modern idea, but it was written right around um, Spanish-American War in regards to the war and to slavery. Um, and, uh, it, it was, it was really interesting. I was originally surprised when I read the other book about, um, his statements suggesting that he was an anarchist. I, I was a little bit surprised by that because I thought, you know, libertarians were a, a more of a new phenomenon, um, as opposed to like the classical liberals who were more for a constitutionally limited republic, historically, like Bastiat was um, had had similar had similar views. He thought that the government was good as long as it was confined to its proper role, which is protecting rights, not infringing other rights. Um, so it's interesting. The basic premise of civil disobedience is that uh, politicians are largely immoral. And honest men um, must be dissenters. If you have a conscience that automatically places you at odds with the state, because the state is inherently corrupt and corrupting. Um, so, so, so that's interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly aware of <laughs> that phenomenon, at least in the state that we have today, um, largely at odds with most of the things the state does, um, if not everything the state does. Um, so, so that's, I mean, that's just something I would automatically agree with right out of the gate. He talks a lot about um, his historical circumstances, mostly slavery, but he also talks about the, the Spanish-American War. He starts out with that, saying that um, you know, a lot of people object to a standing army um, for good for good reason, uh, but he also objects to a standing government, <laughs> which um, I thought was a, an original and a neat idea. The idea that um, a stand that, that there, a standing government is something to be feared, and that's something that is dangerous and not required, not necessary. Um. Because, and he says it's dangerous because in the situation of the Spanish-American War, you have a few people who have a vested interest in something, who are able to use the might of the state to overrule the will of the majority of the people who do not want to go to war um, for their own ends. Um, so you have a situation where, uh, you know, a few people are making decisions and the people really aren't in charge um, and and they're not a, they're the politicians are not accountable for that and getting us into wars is certainly <clears throat> a, a valid concern and something that's applicable to us today Thoreau is is really is really principled and that was one of the things I appreciated a lot about, I'm not really sure what to call this, I'm calling it an essay, I guess, because it's shorter than a book. Um, it's kind of long, I don't know if it would have been a pamphlet. I think it's normally packaged together with Walden, um, at least the copy I have is, is um, Walden and Civil Disobedience. 
So I don't really know how long it is, but it didn't take me very long to read. It's I, I read it online, so I don't know pages or anything, but it was it's just really manageable to read. Um, so he, he's he's very he's very principled. He says. A people, as well as an individual, must do justice, cost what it may. Um, he says, we have to do the right thing, and it doesn't matter what the outcome is. For us personally, or, you know, for the society, if, if freeing the slaves is going to destroy our economy, so be it. It's the right thing to do. And um, we can make arguments. And it, it's, just, it's just interesting. Um the idea of arguing from a pragmatic perspective versus arguing from a principled perspective. I was uh, talking to one of my other coworkers about the wars, and um, it, it was really interesting because I started out, I, I like to argue from principles. Um, so, I was, I, so I started out with, with, a, with a rights-based I, uh, understanding of, you know, it's wrong to kill people. Are we really, is it, is it okay to kill people because that benefits us? I mean, no, that's, that's, that's not legitimate. And the person I was talking to, like, said, well, yeah, I mean, it may not be the right thing to do, but we have to do it anyway, because, um, to preserve our way of life. I can't remember the justification he gave, but I was just shocked. I mean, the total lack of, um, respect for, for principles as as fundamental as um, you know the right to life, liberty, and property, um, to just disregard that um, for some vague, pragmatic. Uh, we need oil and we need gas not to be ten dollars a gallon. Therefore, it justifies war. Um, I was I was really surprised. <laughs> I'd been i I was a little skeptical of the whole. Arguing, um, arguing things from a consequentialist base or, or standpoint, and that kind of changed my mind that the principled arguments are good if the person you're talking to is principled, but um, some people aren't. And so you have to be able to use pragmatic arguments as well. Um, that being said, Thoreau doesn't do that. He says, you know, no matter what the outcome is, we have to do the right thing. And I agree with that. I don't know if it's persuasive to everybody, but it's persuasive to me. Um, even if we lose everything for liberty, it's, it's better to do right than to try to protect safety and security. Um, and, and I definitely agree with that. I saw the Captain America movie and, um, I don't know, I don't know how you guys feel about Captain America or the movies or anything like that, but, um, I liked this, the second one, um, mostly because of my political ideology and the idea that it's not okay to sacrifice freedom for safety, and that that's that's not legitimate. That um, is foolish, and freedom is more important. And there's other political undertones that I appreciated in the movie, um, but but that that's kind of the, it's basically the main theme is that uh, you know security is not is not good enough. Um, we have to have freedom too, and that's true of a lot of dystopian anti-government movies. Um, so there's that. Uh, so he said he basically suggests there's three options. Um, we have unjust laws. It's it's true. Um, in our in our um, in our country, laws are not inherently the same as justice. Just because something's illegal doesn't make it wrong. Um, and they, they prevent people from doing the right thing. So you have three options when, you ha when you're faced with an unjust law. You can obey the law contentedly and not do anything about it. Or you can try to amend the laws through the political process and obey them during time where you're trying to amend it until you have succeeded. Or you can disobey them r right away. You just say, nope, I'm just not gonna, I'm not gonna obey these unjust laws. Um, at all. Uh, Henry David Thoreau clearly leans towards that third option, hence civil disobedience. Um, and I, there's, a, there's a lot of discussion between the second option and the third option. Most people, according to Thoreau, 
suggests the second one. Um, we should try to change the political system first. And um, I've been thinking about this more and more as to whether political reform is possible. Um, and I think it's worth a try. <laughs> I support, I know uh, people have a problem with, with Rand Paul, think he's not um, intellectually consistent or or principled or all that, but um, I think I think it's worth a try to see if we can get somebody elected who is at least libertarian leaning, leaning um, and see what good we can accomplish through the political process, through trying to change the laws. Um, but obeying the laws until that is successful, I, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm okay with that. So I kind of, I guess I kind of appreciate both. Um, he says, Thoreau says, but I, I, I'm skeptical. I have to, I have to think about it more. Thoreau says, um, when the, when the government imprisons unjustly, the true place for a just man is in prison. Um, and it's hard for me to think that when you have an unjust legal system where you can be in prison for doing all kinds of things that aren't wrong and, and never get out, that it's, it's better to kind of surrender yourself to that injustice, to sacrifice your personal freedom, um, without any expectation, any reasonable expectation that it's going to accomplish anything. Um, but, you know, he also, he is, is not really, he's pretty hard on, on passive observers of injustice throw. Um, he says, you know, people hesitate, they regret, sometimes they petition, but they do nothing in earnest and with effort. They wait, well disposed, for others to remedy the evil that they no longer have it to regret. Um, this kind of passive, well, maybe I'll vote for somebody who says they're going to do something about it, but I'm not going to really do anything. It's, it's really convicting. It's like, well, you know, what am I doing to, to fight for justice or, you know, to, to remedy the injustices of our political system? Not a whole lot. I guess making YouTube videos, but <laughs> I'm trying to persuade people, my coworkers, so I'm with limited, with limited success, but, um, you know, there's not, there's not a whole lot that I'm doing. I, I do vote, unlike some libertarians, but, um, I, like, that is a lot. I mean, I don't know. So I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to be one of those people who just talk all day long about what's wrong with the world and don't do anything about it. Um, I just, I haven't found... As of yet, I haven't found a good cause for going to jail, so I, I guess I'll, I'll keep looking for, for a, no, a noble enough cause that I think, you know, I would actually be able to accomplish something by oh, disregarding the law and being rebellious. He says that the people, his neighbors, when he, um, Thoreau was put in jail for like one day, he was really disappointed he didn't get to stay in for longer. Um, but he got out, it totally changed his outlook. He said, um, you know, the people, his neighbors, um, were fair weather friends. They did not generally purpose to do right. Um, and that concerns me, that the fact that the, the majority of people are not morally inclined, don't really care about doing what's right, um, is a problem when you're, when you're going to jail and participating in civil disobedience in order to kind of wake them up and to say, hey, you know, we need to do something about this. But I think from Thoreau's perspective, you don't need those kind of people. You don't need these um, the, the, the these immoral or amoral individuals um, to help. The people you need are are the vocal minority, the minority who is who cares about freedom, who's willing to do something about it. Um, you don't need a majority, you just need um, people who are dedicated. So that was interesting. The most interesting thing I thought about this was, <clears throat> he says, is democracy the last improvement possible in government? Or is it possible to go one step further in recognizing and organizing the rights of men? Um, and he says, you know, it's been said, the gov that government is best, which governs the least, um, certainly. 
I, but he says it finally amounts to this, that government is best, which governs not at all. Um, when people are prepared for it, that's the kind of government they will have. And which, which asks the question, um, if, if in 1850 we were not ready for um, a government which governs not at all, <laughs> um, are we now? And has, has the situation changed enough to where um, that, that's practical in the modern day? I don't know. I, I, I hope so. Um, and I, I plan on at least learning more and trying to do my part in accomplishing more freedom and less government in my life and for those around me. Um, so yes, um, so civil disobedience, it's really interesting. If you haven't read it, I suggest it. It's another really short, um, really short thing. It doesn't take long to read, and it's it's very well written. It's it's nice to read. It's um, it's easy. It's very poetic. Um, it makes a lot of good arguments. Some of them aren't as applicable today. Some of them are extremely applicable to our current political climate. Um, take a look, tell me what you think. If you have any ideas on how, how civil disobedience is practically um, going to be beneficial, I would love to hear them. Um, so yeah, thanks for watching.